Scriptures remind us in Psalm 71 and verse 18, even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, to the people to come. I read of a woman who had gone through a very difficult time. She had recently lost her brother. Her mother had also passed away and she found herself spiraling emotionally in her life. She was having health problems, she eventually lost her job. She became angry with God. She was in despair. As she was going through her mother's things, she found a unique treasure. She found her mother's prayer journal. In fact, her mother had for many years kept a journal of her prayers, the things that she brought before the Lord, the things that she asked the Lord, and also how the Lord responded. And answer those prayers, the times when the Lord stepped in. As she was reading page after page, she was encouraged, she was inspired. In fact, her, mo her mother's faith was passed on to her daughter. The Lord used those journals to refresh and to restore her faith in Him. Started a series that we continue now that's a study of the life of Jacob, journeys with Jacob from grasping to leaning. And as we continue in this study now, I want us to know that we are looking into the very prayer journal of Isaac and Rebecca in the lesson that's, prepared, that's presented. I've called this lesson, When God Steps In, Genesis 25, verses 19 through 26. And just like that mom left something behind for her daughter to be inspired, to see her faith, the, the heroes of the scriptures in the Old Testament would, would set up monuments, monuments to God's glory, detailing the great things that God had done so that children from a future generation could see those monuments and could have the same faith, the, the works and the deeds of God continually being retold. And as we look at Isaac and Rebecca's prayers in this lesson that we present now, we're going to be encouraged to see some who brought a need before the Lord, and also see how God answered that, just like those monuments left behind, just like the mother's prayer journals that were left behind. First of all, I want us to notice 20 years of prayer. I, I don't know if you've prayed for something for 20 years, but what we're going to discover here is that Isaac was praying for many, many years, and, and for what we'll discover soon. Genesis 25, verses 19 through 20 says, this is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Paden Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. The story of Jacob's life actually begins before he was born. It begins with his father, Isaac. And it tells us right from the beginning that this is the account. The Hebrew word is toledoth. It means generations. These are the generations of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. The writer of Genesis uses that toledoth word 10 different times, and it's the way that they introduce one family that God's using to carry on the promise of the seed to the next family line. And so we now come to the Toledoth, or generations of the family line of Abraham's son Isaac. 
we don't surprisingly know a lot about Isaac. He's overshadowed by his father, Abraham, and overshadowed by his own son, Jacob. But there are references to what are called the shrines of Isaac and the house of Isaac that are found in the prophetic book of Amos. And because of that, it's believed that he had quite a following, uh, that he was a, very significant in his day and time. There's one interesting difference when it comes to Isaac and Abraham and Jacob, and that is that Abram and Jacob both had their names changed by God, but Isaac did not. It's believed this is because God himself gave Isaac the name Isaac before he was born. There's another difference. Unlike other males of their time, Isaac remained in a monogamous marriage all through his life. Other males had many wives, multiple wives, but Isaac walked hand in hand with Rebecca all throughout. Also, Isaac is the only patriarch to engage in agricultural activity, and he was very successful at it. He's the only patriarch to never set his feet outside of the promised land. And it says twice that Abraham, here at the beginning, it says twice that he became the father of Isaac. And it says it twice to make it crystal clear that, that the promised seed, the promised one, the promise will be passed through the son Isaac, and it runs through Isaac just as God had said. So it tells us that Isaac is 40 years old when he marries Rebekah, and he is going to be waiting 20 years for children. We also learn a little bit here about Rebekah's family. She was from Padam Aram, and that is one of the relatives of Shem. In fact, Aram is Shem's son, so so Rebekah is a Semite, and just like Isaac is. So they come from the, the same descendants of Shem. Isaac had to have known of God's promises that were given to Abraham, his father. His father would have told him about God's promise of a son and how Isaac was born and how there would be a great, great nation. He was the child of promise, but there were no children. And so it tells us in Genesis 25 and verse 21 that Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. It had been 20 years, it tells us, because we know he had children at the age of 60, 20 years to be precise, but no child. In Isaac's day, for a woman to be barren, to be childless, was, was a disgrace. It meant that they did not had fallen out of favor with God, perhaps, or they had perhaps sinned. It, plus, when it came time to reti retire, you would have no one to take care of you, no one to look after you. This was a dilemma for Isaac. After all, God had promised that there would be a mighty nation, a great nation that would come through his line. One year passes, two years pass, three years pass, four years pass. Still, there's no child. God, where are you? Remember your promise? Thankfully, Isaac did not take matters into his own hand as Abra Abraham had done to bear a son. What Isaac did was he prayed. He prayed for his wife. And while this is the only occurrence that we have here, the way it's written in Hebrew tells us that he prayed not once, but he prayed over and over and over again. In fact, it got to the place now where he is begging the word that's used here, athar, in Hebrew means that Isaac pleaded with God, that Isaac implored God, that he is entreating God, begging him to give, on behalf of his wife, Rebecca, to give her a child. All along, he must have been saying, God, remember your promise. We are told in Scripture to pray without ceasing. We are told to bring our request before the Lord who hears us, to cast our cares before him. We are told to pray and to not give up. We are told that we do not have because we do not ask. But oftentimes, praying is the last thing we do. It, there's much to pray for right now. There are many things where we need God to step in. Isaac needed God to step in, and he prayed for him to do that. And I, feel, I think it's a beautiful picture that he didn't stop. He continued to pray even after all of that time. 
we are told in Scripture that God is able to do more than we can ask or imagine. If only we would bring our request before him. He knows, he certainly knows our needs. In fact, it tells us in Scripture that he knows what we need before we ask. But we're still called upon to bring our needs before him, just as Isaac did here. Sometimes God provides for us in advance before we ask. I had something that took place to me personally recently, years ago when we were installing our garbage disposal underneath our sink. There was a special tool that came with that. It's been years, and I don't know where that, that tool has gone. Yesterday, our disposal got stuck and was frozen. It wouldn't move. Something had had gotten lodged there inside and surprisingly earlier in the day yesterday I was in my closet cleaning some things up and there was this tool that falls out onto the ground out of some bags that I had. I I looked at it. I didn't recognize the tool. I didn't know what, what it was used for, but I set it aside. As I was working on that disposal last night, I had that aha moment. Maybe God put that tool in my hands knowing I would need it later in the day. Sure enough, I went and got the tool, and that's exactly what it was for. I was able to repair it. Sometimes God responds to our needs before we even ask. He's already given to us what we need. Other times, he's waiting for us to, to, to bring our request before him. The Lord did indeed answer his prayer. It says that she became pregnant. And God was waiting, I believe, on the right timing for, for Isaac. And he continued to pray, and she did become pregnant. And like Abraham and Sarah, they had to wait many years for their first child or children. In the narratives of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it is interesting that all three of their spouses, Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel, experienced, ex- experienced barrenness until God intervened showing it was God who was at work. It was God who was going to bring about the promises that he had promised Abraham. As far as I can see in Scripture, this is the only time in the Bible where a husband is specifically said to have prayed, to have intervened on behalf of his wife. Why did Isaac and Rebekah have to wait 20 years? What was God doing during those 20 years of waiting? I I assure you, he was up to something. He was developing Isaac and Rebecca's faith. He was teaching them to be patient, to wait in faithfulness. He was teaching them to not give up, to cling to the promises of God, that God can indeed be trusted. He was also arranging the circumstances in a way so that when the answer finally came, God and God alone would get the credit. And her pregnancy was a direct result of God answering Isaac's prayer, I remind us that he still is doing the same things today. Think about the things that we need God to step into, God to get involved with, a a need at home, a need in our family, needs around the world, global crisis taking place with what we see happening uh, with Ukraine and, and Russia. We need God to intervene We're powerless to do it ourselves, And so we cast our cares before him. We bring our request to him, depending upon him in his timing and in his way and in his approach to answer that prayer however he sees fit. Oftentimes when we pray, we, we want God's will to be accomplished in our life, but then we tell God how to do it and when to do it. And we we need to bring those prayers to his presence, lay them before him and leave it in his faithful and sure hands. Second of all, notice why this. It tells us in Genesis 25, 22, that the babies jostled each other within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. So we now see the other side of the story, Isaac's prayer, God's answer, many prayers and God's answer, and now we see Rebecca praying. We get to peer into her prayer journal if you will. After all, someone wrote this down for a future generation to read. We see that she brings a prayer before God in a time of need. She needed his his involvement. She needed him to step in. And I'm sure that at first, 
whenever they knew that she was expecting, they celebrated, they threw her their version of a baby shower. But as the weeks passed by, the babies, it says, began to jostle. And the word that's here is much stronger in Hebrew than, than, than the English. It means to go to war, to crush, to push around. They were literally wrestling each other inside of her womb. This was her first child. She had, hadn't had an experience with childbearing or childbirth before. She had a midwife, I'm sure, who told her kind of what to expect. But she didn't have the book that we enjoy, what to expect when you're expecting. She depended upon other women who would guide her and tell her what to anticipate. And this most certainly didn't match what she had heard or what she had been taught. I believe this frightened Rebecca. This startled her so much so that she asked the Lord, and it says in Hebrew, why this? It might be translated, why is this happening to me? Or why me? What is this? Is all well? Does this make sense? This is a desperate prayer, and the fact that it's hard to translate, it's unintelligible uh, in Hebrew, it, it doesn't quite make sense. The way she utters it tells us that she is in anguish. She's frightened, wondering what's going on. Why is this? Now, scholars have debated through the years the, the substance of Rebecca's question. Is it a question? Is it a complaint? Is it a theological inquiry? Or is it all of the above? In other words, is she sincerely asking a question? What's going on? Or why is this happening to me? Is it a complaint? I believe it's an honest, honest question that Rebecca is bringing before the Lord. And many of the great saints of Scripture, throughout the pages of Scripture, asked God why. Job asked God why 21 times. God never answered that question quite like, quite like that. But the purpose of Job has a much different purpose behind it than just the answer of why. Jeremiah asked why. Habakkuk asked why. Moses asked why. When Habakkuk asked why, God gave him an answer, but it wasn't the answer that Habakkuk was looking for. It was an answer to continue to live by faith. And here we see that she's asking a sincere question. And she, I like the fact that in the midst of her question, in the midst of her struggle, her, her fear, she says she went to inquire of the Lord. We don't know exactly how that took place, we don't know where that took place. The wording reads that she went somewhere. It was common then to go to a, a place, a holy place, like Bethel, like a place that where, where Jacob would go. We'll see year, years later in his life, we'll see in the future that he would go back to this place again and again because that's where he encountered God. We don't know where she went. Hannah went to the tabernacle is where she brought her request before the Lord. She, I believe it just means that she, she herself brought her request, went in prayer to the Lord, inquiring what in the world is going on. And it is interesting that even after praying for 20 years and the answer finally comes, sometimes it brings more questions and more difficult difficulties with the answer to that prayer. In other words, just because we pray a prayer and God answers that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. And it doesn't mean it's going to come to us in the fashion that we think. Sometimes answered prayer can be as difficult as living through a season of waiting for God to answer a prayer, an unanswered prayer, or a seemingly unanswered prayer. She prayed, and it says that God responded, it appears, directly to her. We don't know whether it was a prophet that he sent there's no mention of that. There's no mention of those types of prophets in those days. It doesn't, could it be a dream of some sort? We don't know. God answered her directly and listen to his words. Genesis 25 and verse 23, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you will be separated and people will be stronger. One people will be stronger than the other and the other will serve, and the, and the older will serve the younger. God's words to Rebecca here in Hebrew read like a poem. I, I think it's beautiful that God responded to Rebecca's prayer directly and with a poem. God is a poet, and he puts 
this explanation in the form of poetry. God, most of the time, speaks to men in the books of Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, but here God speaks directly to a woman and transmits this very important message about the destiny of, of her children to Rebekah and to Rebekah alone. In other words, Isaac is not included in this message. And up to this point, as far as we know, God has not spoken directly to Isaac. God, ans God's answers, God, the way that God answers Rebekah here should remind us that God begins dealing with us before we are even born. He sees our unformed substance. He weaves us together, the, the abilities, the talents, the capabilities, the plans that he has for you and me to, to do. It tells us that we are his handiwork. And he, he's prepared in advance for us to do things. And so this answer to Rebecca should reveal to us that God is very active in the life of babies who have not yet been born. It, it reveals to us that God views a life in the womb very much alive, and they are therefore to be protected. Before there was ever ultrasound, before there was a gender reveal, Rebecca received what we take for granted, the ability to see the baby through ultrasound and 3D imaging, and even to know what the gender is going to be. And I suspect that she gathered that the, they were going to be males because of the way God answered this. He informed her, he informed her, and I can just give it four different phrases, two nations, continual conflict, differing strengths, and a role reversal, the older will serve the younger. I think we learn from this just how important it is for parents to pray always for their children, but even pray for them before they are even born. When Rebecca hears this news, it is shocking to her, especially the last statement, the last point, that that the older will serve the younger. You see, the firstborn in that culture was given inheritance rights. They were going to be the head of the family one day. They received a double portion. But here God is saying the roles are going to be reversed. The rights that normally would have gone to the firstborn are going to go to the secondborn. In other words, Rebecca, the promised seed, the Messiah, God's promise of fulfillment given to Abraham, the covenant would be with the younger, not the older. This was something that Rebecca would remember the rest of her life. And she certainly remembered this later on, as we'll see. It's, it's, it's common in the scriptures for God to use people of all ages, firstborn, secondborn, thirdborn. And even though the firstborn might normally receive the inheritance, God often used second and thirdborn children, Seth, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David, they were all firstborn. God, we need to know, he knows what he's about. He knows who he's looking for. He knows before Jeremiah was even born, God had already declared and ordained that he would put his words in his mouth. He had a purpose and a plan for him. God still knows what he's about. He knows who he has give, given certain gifts to, his plans for the future. He determines the times, the dates, and the places that we are to be born. It's no error, no mistake. And here God pinpoints their lives and their destinies before one day, their, any first, their first breath ever came to be. On October 1st, 1932, it was the fifth inning, game three, of the World Series. They were tied four to four. And during the at-bat, Babe Ruth was standing at the plate. He had strike one. He had strike two. But then he looked over at Wrigley Field, at, at the other players of the Chicago Cubs, and he took his bat and he pointed the center field, and then he pointed with his hand the center field, as if to gesture and say, I'm hitting the ball right there. The next pitch came and he hit a home run 490 feet away at Wrigley Field. And this goes down in history as the time that Babe Ruth called the shot. What I find amazing about God's words to Rebecca is he has called the shot 
specifically of what these boys would be about, what their destinies would be, and even the nations that would come from these two children that would be born. At the burning bush, God called the shot of, to Moses about what was going to take place, what was happening, and how God would deliver his people. Finally, I want us to notice number three, Harry and the hill grabber. Sounds more like a movie. Genesis 25, verse 24 and 26, 24 through 26. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. Verse 25 says, the first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's hill. So he was named Jacob. Isaac, it tells us, was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. I can hear a father screaming in the labor and delivery room, it's a boy, but in this case, it's twin boys. But they're not identical twins. In fact, we're told the differences here in a very unique fashion. The first boy comes out, it says red. And the term that's used here refers to an almost orange rust color that covered his, that, that, his was, that was his complexion, but it also says that he was covered in hair, with much hair like a hairy garment. And it says they named him Esau. Did they name him Esau because of his reddish complexion, or did they name him Esau because the word, because he was hairy? And the full meaning here, it's hard to discern because there's a wordplay that's going on with the word Esau and the word hair. The word Esau and the word hair, which, and the, the meaning of the name Esau is no longer known. You'll notice in your Bibles there's an asterisk that, that says at the bottom that we think it means red. Probably red because later when they would settle, when Esau would settle in the region of Edom, that re refers to red there. And by the way, Herod is a descendant of, of Esau. Herod down the road would be a descendant of Esau, and he is not referred to as an Edomite. It says the second twin came out of the womb with his hand grasping Esau's hill. What a sight to see. They, the baby comes out, they see a little white, a little hand grabbing hold of, of Esau's hill. Obviously, his complexion is much fairer than Jacob's, or, or, or fairer than Esau's. And so he's grabbing onto this hill and I think they're so shocked by this, they say, let's name him Jacob, which means literally to grab the heel. Years later, that word would become known as, it would be, it would be, that word would come to be known as supplanter or cheater. His behavior at birth symbolized the strife that will take place in the life between Jacob and Esau and all throughout their lives. It tells us here that Isaac was 60 years old. What do we learn here? We see the power of, of parents praying for their children even before they're born. Isaac praying for his wife to have children, asking for provision, and then Rebecca asking for understanding about what's going on. What a wise prayer for any mom and dad to bring before the Lord for understanding about how to raise these children. What do you have planned for them? What do you want me to teach them? I think we especially learn that you can, no matter the challenge, no matter the need, no matter the difficulty, that you can turn to God in prayer with anything. And we're told in Scripture to just cast our cares before Him, whatever keeps you up at night whatever has you worried during the day, whatever questions, the things that, that, that you're dealing with, we're told to bring these before the Lord. Not, not to bring them last, but to bring them first. We also learn that you can, you can turn to God in the midst of any struggle that you may be having, a question, a, something maybe you don't understand going on in your family. Chaos hits your family. Challenges hit your family, and you're trying to discern from God What's going on and how to respond to that? It's exactly what Rebecca did. We also turn to God with our questions. 
Here we have a sincere question brought before the Lord. Think about how many questions we go through in our mind throughout the day or throughout the week that we don't know the answer to, and yet we can, we can bring those questions to the Lord. It's God who's able to make sense of what's going on. It's God that's able to, to help us to have wisdom. It says that, that he gives wisdom to all who ask without wavering. We bring our request before him, and he's able to open our eyes of understanding. When God, when we bring our prayers to God, we should realize that just when we're bringing a need before him, we're leaving it in his hand to work it out as he see best. We're called upon here to have the faith to seek him and have the faith to trust him. Larry and Ronnie are two men that every year go on a two-day canoe trip down the Buffalo River for about a 10-mile journey on the rapids. This year, though, it was different. When they arrived at the Buffalo River, the water level was high. It had rained. The, the rapids were difficult. They were going to be tough. In fact, the, the outfitter that dropped them off there at the, at the river warned them with caution to be very, very careful, careful because of how rough the river was. They reached the place on the river where they were going to rest for the night. They had all their gear, but the water was going so fast, the rapids were so rough, they couldn't get over to the bank, and they passed right by it. The water kept getting faster and faster, rougher and more challenging. The water was just rolling along. They were trying to control with their paddle, but suddenly they lost control, and the canoe began to circle around. The water was so fast, it pulled the oars out, and suddenly the, the wa water just turned the canoe upside down in a flash. They lost everything in their boat. They were hanging on to rocks for dear life as the waters were passing them by. They were shouting for help, but there was no one in earshot, no one that they could see. Their canoe had gone across the river and was caught in some brush and rocks upside down, halfway submerged. Larry kept hanging on to the rocks, but Ronnie made his way across. And as he made his way across to grab the boat and turn it over, suddenly the water just pushed it up so fast, and the edge of that canoe slammed him in his forehead. He immediately fell unconscious underneath the water. Larry let go of the rocks, grabbed Ronnie up out of the water, his head above the water, and until he could regain consciousness, there was a gash there. He was bleeding now. It, it was already starting to grow dark, and before long, it was night. There was not a sound of, of voices in sight. No one could hear their cries for help. At one point, Larry just looked up at the sky and says, Lord, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where will our help come from? He said there was nothing else we could do but depend upon the Lord at that time. We didn't have a first aid kit. We didn't have a way, a canoe. The canoe was long gone. They prayed for help. They said, God, we need you to step in. We need you to intervene. Then in the distance, they saw a faint light. It, it came from, from a boat that was making their way, and the light grew brighter and brighter, coming closer and closer, and they saw two men in a canoe with a lantern. We called out to them as loud as we could. We screamed at the top of our voices. They called out as loud as they could, screaming at the top of their voices, waving their arms. And the men that were in that boat pulled up slowly to Larry and to Ronnie, could see that they were in need. They saw that they were just hanging on to these rocks for dear life. Interestingly, they made their way across the river without any problems at all. They come up to Larry and Ronnie, and they introduce themselves as a doctor and a Marine. Larry would later say that he was thinking at that very moment, my, when God, God sends help, he doesn't mess around. The doctor tended to Ronnie's needs as best as he could. He helped Ronnie and and Larry make it down, downstream to their end point and get out of the river. They got them out of the river, and the outfitters had put their cars there so that they could get back to safety. 
The rescuers who had appeared out of nowhere like angels disappeared in the same way. There, there was no sound of a truck leaving. There was no light from the lantern. And they got back. If they got back into their canoe, they were gone. God had indeed stepped in. God sent help in a desperate time of need. Larry said that was the day that God stepped in for him. I asked the question to all who listen, where do you need God to step in to your life? Where do you need his help? Where do you need him to intervene right now around the world, in this country, in this state, in this city, in your life and in your family? I call upon you to depend upon him, to call upon him with faith and trust that he will indeed help and hear our prayers. Even when I'm old and gray, it says in Psalm 71, 18, even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation. Let's pray. Father, we do depend upon you and we do urgently have matters in our lives where we need you to step in. Thank you for the example of Scripture that shows us how you stepped into the life of Isaac and the life of Rebekah, guiding them, remembering your promise, and fulfilling it. Father, we ask you to step into our lives, to hear our prayers on behalf of what's taking place in Ukraine, that you would deliver that, con that country from attack and oppression as only you can. You are all-powerful. And Father, I pray for our needs in our church, the needs of my family and the families that are part of our congregation, that you would step in and intervene. We depend upon you in faith. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.
still have.